Christ. The day that we have been made as a new creature in God, that very day, that very moment, He has given us the ministry and the word of reconciliation. Therefore, no believer is unemployed. No believer is unemployed. God has given us a job to do. And yesterday I was reminding you of seven important verses that you need to remember. Yep. First one is our calling. First Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 20. Let every man abide in the same calling in which he is called. Second one is work. Mark's gospel chapter 13 and verse 34. For the son of man is as a man who has left his house, undertook a long journey, and gave every man his work before leaving and undertaking this long journey he gave every man his work and the third thing we reminded ourselves was from first peter chapter 4 and verse 10 as everyone had received the gift even so minister the same one to another as the good stewards of the manifold grace of god as every man had received the gift there is no single believer who is ungifted in the body of christ God has given you a gift. You are special. You are important. The day you are being born again, the day the Lord saved you, God gave you a special gift to minister to Him. What is this gift? It is the divine ability for divine service. It's a God-given ability for divine service. God not only calls us to His work, but enables us to fulfill that calling and that work. And then fourthly, we also saw from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 18, God had set everyone in his body as it hath pleased him. There's a place appointed for me to work for him. I need to know my place. And I need to operate from the field where God has kept me. And then we went on to see from Galatians chapter 6 and verse 5, that every man bear his own burden. There is a burden. There is a share of the responsibility that God lays upon our shoulders. God has given you a burden. God has given you and me our share of responsibility. And sixthly, we went on to see from Romans chapter 14 and verse 12. So that every one of us has to give an account of himself to God. There's going to be a day when God is going to ask us to give an account of our lives. And then seventhly, Revelation 22 and 12. Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone as his work shall be. There is going to be a rewarding day when the Lord is going to recognize my sacrifice, my labor, my work, and he's going to publicly reward and honor me. So we are all called the people. God has given us a calling. And we are called to be reconcilers. To be mediators. The Mark has been speaking so much in practical terms as to how we need to reach out to the lost people. God has called you and me to reach out to the lost people. We are reconcilers. <laughs> I think it was Andrew Murray who said there are two kinds of Christians in the world. Backsliders and soul winners. Backsliders and soul winners. If you are not a, a soul winner, you are already a backslider. You are already a backslider. And one of the verses, very powerful verses, that Jesus spoke Matthew's gospel chapter 12 and verse 30 Matthew's gospel chapter 12 and verse 30 he that is not with me is against me and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad spiritually you can only take two possible positions <coughs> Either you are with him or against him. There is no neutrality about it. Either I am actively gathering souls or I am actively scattering souls. Well, you might say, though I am not winning souls, I don't harm anyone. 
I come regularly to the church, I pay my tithe, I try to encourage others. All that is good argument. But Jesus said, He that gathereth not with me scattereth. It's not an option, it's a command to go out and win others. It's a proof that we really follow Him. He makes us fishers of men. If we are not actively gathering, we are actively scattering people. We are potentially harmful for others if we are not active soul winners. God called us to be reconcilers. Reconcilers. And then we go on to the third word we use, prophets. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. Usually when we think of the word prophet, we think of the spiritually elite people. People who have been called, set apart, have been given special divine gifts to become prophets unto God. But look at Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10 and you find the definition of prophecy and of a prophet. And I fell at his feet to worship him and he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that I have the testimony of Jesus, worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Every time you stand in a bus station, while traveling, talking to a co-passenger on the roadside, when you talk about Jesus, when you testify about Jesus, in the sight of God, you are doing the work of a prophet. God looks upon you, though the world may, may not recognize you. You are doing the work of a prophet. You are standing up and speaking for God, speaking for Jesus. God called you and me to be prophets unto God. And then the word businessman, Luke 19.30, you know the parable. When the noble man calls his ten servants, gives each one of them a pound and tells them, do business till I come. Occupy till I come. That's how King James puts it. And the root word and the actual meaning is do business till I come. God has given us the treasure of the gospel, the only treasure that the world needs to have. God has given us the good gospel, the only gospel the world needs to hear. There is no other gospel under heaven on the face of the earth and God has given that gospel into our hands. Writing to Corinthians, 2nd Corinthians chapter 4, in verse 4 we read, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should ever shine unto them. But then when you go to verse 7, Paul writes on to say, but we have this treasure in our earthen vessels. This treasure of the glorious gospel of Christ, God put into these earthen vessels. That's why we are precious. That's why we have a great commission and a great ministry to fulfill for God and for God's glory. He kept this treasure in our hearts. Treasure that can really enrich the other person for eternity. We are businessmen taking this treasure, investing our time in people. Have you ever thought of this truth? That the only wealth that you would ever be able to carry over to the other show are the souls that you have won and nothing else. Not a penny goes with you. None of the titles that we have earned on this side of eternity ever goes with us. We leave everything, but there is something that you cannot leave behind. The souls that you have won for the Lord. It is said that Charles Harris Spurgeon used to say, I have a holy selfishness. You might be wondering how holy and selfishness can go together. He said, I have a holy selfishness. And then went on to explain these two words. He said, 
I desire and long for that day when I meet Jesus as I approach him. I expect hundreds of people on both sides to rush to me and tell me in the hearing of Jesus. Brother Spurgeon, do you know why I am here in heaven? It's because you took time to tell me the gospel. I want hundreds of people to tell me that on the day when I meet Jesus in his hearing and to make that vision a reality, that dream a reality. I work so hard. He says, that's my goal. That's my desire. That's my holy selfishness. God wants to use you and me as prophets, as reconcilers, as businessmen for God. When you invest your time, invest with the treasure that God has given you, it's going to come back to you in manifold measure. 2 Corinthians 5.20 tells us we are ambassadors for Christ. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords has been pleased to appoint you to represent Him in this world. To represent the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We are His ambassadors. Never belittle yourself. Never degrade yourself. You are special before God. If you are a child of God, if you are a regenerate person, if you have the experience of salvation, if you have the assurance that your sins have been forgiven, God looks upon you and me and tells us, you are my ambassador. I have chosen you to represent me, to represent my cause, my gospel before a lost world. We are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Psalm 126 verses 5 and 6 tells us that we are sowers, we are farmers. We sow the seed of God's word in the hearts of people. We are called to sow the seed. The seed looks so small, it looks so lifeless. You don't know what it's going to produce when you sow it in the hearts of people. And the psalmist tells us, he that beareth precious seed and soweth it is going to come back with sheaves rejoicing. Though that sow in tears shall reap in joy. The story is told of a missionary who went to a far land in order to minister the gospel. He tried for weeks and months together and nothing happened. And then he was so discouraged, he thought probably this is not the place that God assigned me to be and work for him. So he wrote to the mission headquarters saying, please assign me another territory. I am tired of being in this place without any fruit, without any result. Then they wrote back to him, giving him scripture and encouraging him, saying that they were praying for him, that he should stay on and work for the Lord. He tried for some more time, got even more discouraged and wrote back again. Once again, there was a letter trying to encourage him. And finally, this man thought, these people are going to only write letters and keep encouraging me. Finally, he gave a telegram to them. He said, I'm going to quit my post and I'm going to come back to the headquarters. And then they knew the urgency and they gave him a reply. And in that reply, they just used two words. They just used two words. And those two words did a great miracle in the life of this missionary. You know what those two words were? He just said, try tears. Try tears. You have tried preaching, you have tried doing so many things. Do it with tears and see what happens. God blessed. The passion of that man, the tear-filled message of that man, and many were converted. We are called to be sowers of God's word. God has given us his word. Memorize the scripture. The most prominent scriptures talking about the lostness of man, the sinfulness of man, and the saviorhood of Jesus. Keep these scriptures ready, and as you talk to people, 
share with them what the Bible says, what the scripture says, what God says. And the word would defend itself. And the word would change the hearts of people. Then we went on to say from Matthew chapter 5 verses 13 and 14, we are the light of the world, we are the salt of the earth. Now both these speak of silent ministries. So far we have been emphasizing on spoken ministries where we need to verbally articulate our faith, communicate our faith in words, intelligent and audible to people. But the Lord was also equally emphasizing the importance of being a silent witness where my very lifestyle speaks to people, where my own life becomes a gospel to others to read, where I am an epistle, as we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 2, where I become an epistle for people to read. The light does not make any noise every morning as the sun comes up, it lights the whole world, one part of the world. It doesn't make a big bang and it doesn't make a big noise. Salt does not make its presence felt. You cannot see that. But when you taste the curry, you know that salt has been used. It's hidden. In a hidden, silent way, God expects us to be a witness for Him. Our good works, Matthew 5.16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify God in heaven. The story is told of a man who used to, full of zeal, used to go about witnessing for Christ. And uh, he took hold of one of his friends and started sharing the gospel. That man showed no interest. The second time again, he tried to share the gospel with him. Second time, he patiently heard it. The third time, he sighted him from far and he started turning back and running away from him. And for several months, they never had a chance to meet each other. After several months, this man who was running away from this evangelist, from this witness, happened to come on the road and uh, as he was approaching, this evangelist thought he's going to now turn back and run away from him, but he doesn't. He comes back with a smile and what's more interesting, he comes with a Bible in his hand. And this man says, wow, oh, something good has happened. After all, I have labored so much, testified to this man so many times, and now he has accepted the Lord as his Lord and Savior. So he meets him, finally greets him, and the other man greets him with all happiness and joy and smile on his face. And then the evangelist tells him, I'm so glad that all my efforts have yielded fruit. And today you are a Christian because I testify to you about the saving grace of God. The other man, without losing his composure, he tells him, It's true that I have become a Christian, but I want to tell you it's not because you testified. Now that was a little rude remark to make. And uh, this man was more curious. He said, Then what happened? Then how did you come to know Christ as your personal savior? He said, I was so depressed a few months ago. One day I left my home, I had a keychain in my hand. As I was walking along the road, I was walking very close to a gutter. I did not realize there was a big gutter close by. I took the keychain in my hand, I was playing with it. I was deep in thought. Before I could realize, the key chain escaped my finger and fell into that dirty gutter. I cannot get back home, I cannot open my door if I am not going to get back that key chain. So I stood there staring at that key chain in that dirty gutter. I dare not jump into that gutter lest I defile myself. People came along, they stood there, they started giving several suggestions as to how I could retrieve it. They gave many ideas. The more time I waited, the crowd began to swell even more. 
And there comes along a man whom I know not so well, I can say he was just an acquaintance. He comes along, he looks at me and says, what's wrong here? He said, I've lost my keychain, there it is. Can you sign, can you see that? The man looks at it, does not speak a word, waits for a moment, and quietly in the sight of everybody, gets into the gutter. Dirties himself completely. Gets that keychain, comes out, goes to the tap, washes it clean, gives it back to the man. Without waiting to receive a thank you from him, he quietly keeps walking away. And this man was so much shocked that here is a man who simply dirtied himself in order to get back that keychain to him. He walks behind him, stops him and asks him, I am the owner of the keychain, but I did not dare jump into that gutter. What made you to jump into that gutter? I am so sorry that you have to dirty yourself and soil your clothes to get me that keychain. That man replied, Sir, the dirt on my clothes is nothing compared to the dirt that Jesus took in order to jump into another gutter, much worse than this, where I was struggling to come out. That's all he said. And he kept going. He said, day and night I began to think of what this man began to tell me. Jesus jumped into a much worse gutter pull me out and today I am what I am because of what Jesus did and what I have done for you is nothing in comparison he said that one act of that man touched my heart he turned me to Christ made me to go to the scripture discover this Savior and today I am a child of God God has called you and me to be his witnesses. God has called you and me to be an epistle. May the Lord give us grace that all these terms that we have been discussing one after the other may become a reality, a truth in our lives as we are racing against time in these end times that we may be true witnesses of his glory. Shall we pray?